agriculture. It's the economic engine that drives this region. On this episode of Valley's Gold, we're horsing around. From racing the raining, we'll cover the Valley's equine industry. So join me, Ryan Jacobson, as we saddle up on this adventure. Valley's Gold is produced through a partnership between the Fresno County Farm Bureau and Valley PBS. Production funding for Valley's Gold is provided by... Everyone enjoys getting together to laugh, to talk, and mostly to eat. It sounds so simple, but the reality is that it takes a lot of hard work to feed us. The next time you sit down to eat, remember to thank our farmers, Gar Tutelian Incorporated since 1949 at 800-696-6108. The Myers Water Bank and Wildlife Project, a water resource and education program, providing an educational experience that teaches students in the Central Valley about water and wildlife. For more than 60 years, Brandt has been a major supplier of agricultural specialty products. Formerly Monterey Ag Resources, Brandt provides sustainable solutions for both conventional and organic growers. Brandt, we're proud to call the Valley home. I'm at the Harris Farms River Ranch near Sanger to learn about horses. We may have manager Dave McLaughlin. Dave, thanks for joining me. My pleasure, Ryan. Let's talk about what exactly is done here on the River Ranch. Well, River Ranch is our nursery and layup facility for, for uh, some of the horses from training division. The, the main farm in Kalinga has the, uh, been the heart of the operation for quite some time and, and we have our training center, we have a seven eighths mile training track. We stand the seven stallions over there and we breed about 350 mares each year. We deliver the babies over there and this year we delivered a, a little over 170. Um, the foals are, are with the mares over there until the time they're weaned, then they're schooled and then they're brought over here to the river ranch, uh, to their nursery, where they, they stay for approximately a year until they return to the Kalinga farm to go into training. Got it. And we're learning about thoroughbreds. What is a thoroughbred? Well, it's, it's a, a breed of horses designed primarily for racing. And when you say a breed of horse, it, there's actual, it's not a bunch of breeds put together that make up a thoroughbred, it's an actual breed? It is a, it is a breed that, and um, governed by the jockey club. Got it. Now you talked about the nursery stage and when they go back out to train, what does training consist of and what does it take to get these horses in tip top shape for a race? Well, it's a, a rather long process. I mean, it actually begins here because it's how we group them in pasture. It, it, I mean, they're naturally, uh, they love to compete. Uh, when you see them gallop in the pastures and all, somebody always wants to be first. When they go over to the other side, they, they're taught to accept a rider. <laughs> then uh, we take them, uh, they're actually in a lot of conditioning where they will go to the training track and they'll jog inside horses, outside other horses, in front of and back. And we just introduce them to everything that they will be asked to do later on. Well, Dave, these horses are a lot like human competitors and it takes a lot to get ready for the racetrack. But what age will they generally start racing competitively and how long can they last in the industry? Well, the most precocious ones will start as two-year-olds, uh, but ideally, I think if, the, if they're a little more mature when they uh, begin to compete, uh, it's a little, little better for them. Uh, typically, you have a, a good three-year-old, and a three- and four-year-old is, is where you can make an awful lot of money, and, and that certainly is the, the goal yeah. of, of having these horses race. Ideally, that you have a, an older horse to, to go on and, and race as a five- and six-year-old, but uh, uh, a lot of them don't make it that long. 
And that's a perfect segue to one of your most famous, I don't want to even say visitors, one of your most famous stock that has come out of this area. Can you talk about him and his claim to fame here recently? Well, California Chrome is one of the kids. <laughs> he, uh, he's a, a, a Valley product uh, uh, through and through. Uh, his uh, mother, or his dam, is a mare by the name of Love the Chase and Sire Lucky Pulpit. Both of those reside at the main farm in Kalinga. And let's talk about the retirement of these horses. When it does come time for them to leave the competitiveness of racing, uh, what, is, what does life consist of after that? Well, some of them can be placed in, in uh, uh, homes uh, as pleasure horses or uh, we've developed a program for a lot of ours. Uh, it's a pasture pal program like like our old guy right over here is uh, a 28 year old gelding that uh, we put out with the young horses and he's uh, uh, the the big brother uh, of the group and, and actually provides a lot of stability. So he kind of sets the pace for the activity uh, level. He schools them. <laughs> and uh, uh, keep things in order. And that did answer one of my last questions I actually had was life expectancy. I know horses are generally longer than most other farm animals, what we consider, but you just mentioned the guy behind us is 28 years old. Right. Is that common for horses? Oh, in the 20s, uh, you know, mid 20s is, uh, is really kind of pushing the envelope. He's, uh, he's definitely an outlier. <laughs> Well, Dave, thank you so much. This has been incredible and for to kind of lay the foundation for what the California horse racing industry offers here. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Okay. I've headed over to Clovis to meet up with John Lazan to learn about horseshoeing. John, thanks for joining me this morning. Thank you for having me. Well, let's begin with how'd you get started as a horseshoer? When I was in high school, I used to go ride horses out at Joe Rodriguez's house right here in Clovis down the street. And uh, that's, he, he shot horses for a living at the time and I just really struck an interest. And um, when I got out of high school, I uh, enrolled in horseshoe school up at Oregon State under Larry Bewley. I've just been after it every, ever since then. And it's, uh, that was in 94, so this is my 21st year. Wow. And we, we talked about horseshoeing, but the correct terminology is a farrier, correct? Let's start with the beginning. I saw you starting off just with cleaning the hoof. Explain what goes on there. Uh, basically, you're just taking an observation of the foot at that point. Um, you're, uh, you're looking for any, anything that's out of shape, out of whack as far as breaking, abscesses, any, anything that might, uh, you know, anything that might be out of shape that you might have to attest when you're actually shooting the horse. So I start with cleaning the foot, and then I go on to knifing the foot out. And it's all a lot by feel, I'm assuming, too. That tool you're just going and you're going to the I think depth so. that you know where it goes. I think so. I absolutely think that uh, a, lot, a lot of horseshoeing has to do with a lot of feel in here. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, think, I think you see a lot with your ears and your hands. Yeah, yeah. And then the next thing I saw you doing was some snipping, kind of just taking off that yeah. exterior. You're trimming off the length, uh, basically like trimming your fingernails, I guess would be, you know, easy to understand that. Uh, yeah. Trimming it down, getting it shaped up. Uh, cleaning the foot up real good, and then, and then you go on to uh, determine what size of shoe you want to use. Yeah, and explain that. There's, there's several different types of shoes and different types of shoes that you can yes. actually use for different types of horses. Yes, there is. In this particular case, this horse here that we did today is a, a reigning cow horse, but he's basically on vacation right now, so um, normally we'll, we'll use a different shoe than we did on him today, but since he's turned out, he's kind of on a break, so we put what we call just a cowboy shoe on him. Okay. Um, basically just to hold his feet together and, you know, keep him from breaking up and getting all out of shape. And I was amazed because I have always known about the, uh, the steel type of shoes, but you actually showed me some aluminum that are used for different types of situations as well. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, going back to the natural balance shoe, the aluminum shoe, like when the horse is performing, we, we use an aluminum shoe on him. Uh, more for performance, not so much as therapeutic, like a lot of, you know, that shoe can be used as a therapeutic shoe as well. But. Got it. Okay. Okay. Well, the next thing I saw you head over to your trailer and that's when the actual shoeing process began. Explain to me what you can do out of this trailer and the different types of shoeing you can do. Well, basically, I, I mean, I'm set up for most any kind of shoeing that, you, that we need to do. I mean, yeah. as far as types of horses or whatever, but uh, most generally, uh, I, I'm, I'm kind, of a, kind of a cowboy shoer. I, and the, uh, when we talked about, uh, you were explaining the difference between hot shoeing and cold shoeing to me. What exactly is that? Hot shoeing, I think, uh, you know, even back when I started in 94, there was a lot of hot shoeing because the, the shoes weren't as good. Yeah. And today, today you can buy shoes that 
All you need to do is open and close a few and, and they fit good. The shoes have come so far just in the last 20 years that I've been in it. Yeah. And uh, I rode with a lot of old schoolers, I call them, you know, where they, back in the day, they used to hand make everything. They didn't, yeah. ha they didn't even have what they call keg shoes. Okay. And um, I'm more of a cold shoer guy. I don't use the fire as much as I probably did when I started. And the reason is because it's a time factor. Yeah. Uh, and there's no really reason to it as far as, unless you want a hot set one. Yeah. But you can do that with, with, the, with the new style of shoes, just the same. Yeah. And as far as the fitting of the shoe, is that just a lot of eyeballing? We talked about that feeling. I, you, you don't have a tape measure out or anything. You're just, you're just doing that all visually inspection. 100%, I 100% think it's, it's eyeball and, and a feel. You know, yeah. I mean, you, it's, you know, you, you kind of get a, a, a photograph in your head of what a foot yeah. should and could and what, what it might look like. And basically from there, you know, you just go to the animal and try to shape to fit it the best you can. Yeah. And then when we go to the actual process to put the shoe on the horse, you're uh, you're doing the feel, and it, it's just a lot of hammering, just trying to get that thing shaped just the exact way it needs to be on that foot. That's right. In this particular case, I also hot set them, which I, I think is a good thing when it's wet and wintry like this. Yeah. You know, anything under that shoe, you can kind of burn off, and yeah. you know, as far as thrush or whatever, it takes care of that. But I actually saw the application of the shoe with the nails. It's a process that maybe looks a little painful, but it doesn't look like the horse feels anything. And you're good at it. You did it very fast. Thank you. How do you accomplish that? Uh, again, it, I think nailing is, is all about uh, hearing and feeling. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's definitely a learned technique. It's not, it's very difficult to learn. It's not yep. easy. And the final process of that looked kind of like a manicure. Yep. You just got to do some filing and smooth everything out. Yep. The finishing process, uh, put them up on the stand and clinch them up and uh, try to have a little pride and shine it up and make it look nice. Yeah. You know, something you'd be proud to look at when you're done. And when this process is completed, how long does that shoe last on a horse approximately? I know it depends on the working conditions and everything, but. Yeah, it does depend. Uh, you know, a performer tour shoes, they, they're, they're pretty good about staying with them about every six weeks. Uh, basically that's preventative maintenance instead of, you know, be replaced before it needs to be replaced, basically like changing oil in your car. The last question I have for you, John, is how many horses can you do a day? This is a very physical job. That's a tricky question. <laughs> uh, depends. If we're just trimming, um, you know, a guy can do anywhere to 20 to 30 trims a day and, and feel pretty good. Um, as far as the shoeing goes, I, I like to shoe four or five a day and, and, and as many trims. You know, every, everybody's a little different. Yeah, good. Well, great, John. This has been incredibly informative. I knew very little about the farrier business, but I uh, know a whole lot more now. So appreciate you taking time to join me. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Appreciate it. I've headed out to Sanger to meet up with Tracer Gilson of Gilson Performance Horses. Tracer, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thanks well, for coming. Tracer, let's begin with, tell me a little bit about this operation. Uh, we train and raise reining horses here. Um, Lauren Booth owns the place. Uh, we try and raise really good horses that we can go show and be competitive on. Great. How'd you get involved in this industry? Uh, I grew up doing it. <laughs> I've done it my whole life. So Now, when we talk about reining horses, just I, I don't know anything about reining horses. Start with some of the uh, terminologies that are used and um, what it exactly means. Okay. The, the definition of a reining horse is willfully guided with little or no apparent resistance. Okay. So, uh, for the major events, okay. we show them one-handed, okay. and this right here, they're like driving a little Ferrari. <laughs> you know, they got to uh, steer and stop when you tell them to stop, and dictated to every step. So, and it's all by the feel of the reins, is what you're. Yeah, your reins and your legs and okay. your voice. When do you, when you get to the training of these animals, when does that begin, and how long of a career can can these animals have? We we start them when they're two. Uh, the basic birthday for a horse is January 1st. So they're two-year-old deer, January 1st. Okay. We start them from ground zero. Okay. And some of the horses that I've trained, they're still 14, 15 years old and, and wow. still performing. And I know one thing you're very proud of here is the, uh, the, the, the performance that you put these guys through. What does some of these trainings consist of? Is, is it a daily workout for these horses? And Yeah, it's a, it's a daily routine we work six days a week they get sunday off we get sunday <laughs> off um i have a really good crew that does uh, two-year-olds and and helps me get through the day got so. it 
and there's so many different competitions for reining. Mm -hmm. Can you explain to me maybe some of the major events that take place? All right, the, the first event for reining horses, uh, it's their three-year-old year, year okay. and those are called the fraternities. Okay. And then uh, four, five, and six-year-olds are for the derbies. Um, the fraternity is like the the prestigious thing. I mean, that's what. So every, very early in their career, they're yeah. being judged at that point. Right, so. and you kind of I mean the next great one ends up there in December. So, got it. Okay. Uh, and there's only one every year. We talk about the workout these horses undergo. I mean, how much uh, on average on a daily basis do they work out, and the rest of the time is it just kind of rest and preparing for the next day? Yeah, you know they're. It's anywhere from 30 minutes to, to an hour. And then when they're done, they get, uh, they get a bath every day unless it's really cold. Um, we have a very strict uh, nutrition policy yeah. and maintenance policy as far as soundness and, and health. Um, if they had a big strenuous workout, we have ice boots that we put on their legs to keep their tendons uh, healthy. We feed uh, alfalfa cubes, grass hay, and uh, I feed Neutrina Safe Choice. It's a grain. Uh, yeah. I get that daily. Um, and we just, they're athletes, so we, we try and take as good a care of them as we can. Absolutely, and, absolutely. Uh, and Tracer, could you explain to me what happens at a competition? So each, each class um, at, at each horse show has a designated pattern that every exhibitor has to do, and they're judged on that. There's 12 different patterns. Everybody walks in with a 70, that's average. Yeah. And the judges score you on a plus or minus basis from there. So a 75 score would be excellent, a 65 score would be very poor. Wow, okay. And so. there's uh, maneuvers, there's a sliding stop, there's three in every pattern, uh, spin both directions, large fast and small slow circles both directions, rollbacks both directions, back up and lead change and they're all in different sequences. And then the other fun part is, I actually got to see the next generation out here. You already got your, your children out here riding already. Yeah, yeah, she's out here <laughs> tearing it up. <laughs> awesome, well, Tracia, thank you so much for you giving me a little bit more experience about the reining horses, and um, it's been a quite an experience to get on top of one of these and try one out, so yeah, I appreciate cool. it. You bet. I'm at the Heart of the Horse Therapy Ranch near Clovis, and with me I have Executive Director Guy Adams and the one and only Jack Hanna. Thanks for joining me, guys. Yeah, great to be here. Well, Guy, Thank I you. want to begin with you. Can you kind of set the foundation of what Heart of the Horse Therapy Ranch is? What we do is we work with kids, uh, adults, and veterans with all forms of, uh, I, I like to say different abilities, brain trauma, missing limbs, uh, cerebral palsy, you know, MS, you name it, we work with them, help them get their minds, bodies, and souls moving. And you're kind of the brainchild to make this all happen. How did it come to you and how did you make it all work? I wish I was the brainchild, you know. <laughs> I think God just put us on this ranch and, and uh, it just took off. <clears throat> we had a uh, little autistic boy come out and then we had a little girl in a wheelchair come out and it just took off from there. And what year did it begin? Uh, we're going on our fifth year now. Wow. Jack, you're one of the yeah. great board members out here that helped make yeah. this all happen. Amen. How'd you, get, how'd you get involved in it? I came out and I what, what I saw uh, I'm, su I'm surprised that I was surprised <laughs> that uh, uh, what I saw happening, and I said, you know what, I got to, I got to get involved with this. And that's what I've been impressed with, yeah. Guy. You told me some of the numbers when I first arrived here, a uh, uh, number of riders yeah. come out on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. What are you up to now? Well, uh, just K through 12 uh, last year, 2,400 sessions. Wow. Yeah. And so you, and that's you so see, you're averaging 50 to 100 a week, just depending mm -hmm. on the week. You said. Uh, 35 yeah. to, uh, no, excuse me, 45 to 50 a week. Wow, so that's that's impressive. And when we talk about, you know, this really is an operation that works because of the volunteers that make it happen. Oh, the volunteers yeah. are the heart of the program. It's amazing. <clears throat> but you know yeah. something, Ryan? What I see is what's happening to our, well, I call them clients, he calls them something else. <laughs> the, the, the little kids in, that come, and not just the kids, but the, the adults. What happens to them physically as well as emotionally and, and spiritually. Yeah. It strengthens them. It strengthens them in every aspect of their life. Yeah. And that's why I, I got a few of the stories this morning, yeah. but Guy was telling me a whole lot of other ones that have taken place on yeah. the ranch here and just uh, the lives that have been changed. And it's the individuals, not just the riders, yeah. but their families and the mm -hmm. community that's everybody, around them. Everybody's impacted by it positively. Yeah. And another feature about this ranch is this. 
everything that's done here is done safely. Yeah. Nobody has ever been hurt in three years and a half. Yeah. We've never had anybody hurt. Yeah. And Guy, total number of horses that are part of the operation. Well, we relieved two guys of their, re their rescue horses. So at, a, at one point we had up to 27. Right now we supply Reedley College uh, so they could have a, a equestrian team. Yeah. And uh, we've, we've given them horses for the last two years. And then they help us place those horses with good families. And uh, we have a horse that was dumped off here like a dog. His name was Rocky. Uh, anywhere between six and eight months old, the vet said. And he had a broken leg. And that was four years ago. And now Rocky is in Merced, California. Works one hour a day, because that's all he can hack, uh, with a little eight-year-old girl with, with autism. And we wow. plan on doing that more, getting horses out in other areas where they don't have a place like ours. That, or maybe we'll just start some more. Just as every rider that come out here, comes out here has a story, every horse on this you property you. has a story. In fact, I have some interesting stories on the two horses that are behind you today. Tell yeah. me a little bit about them. The big guy right there, that's Bowie. Bowie at Saratoga. <laughs> Bowie had a great race career. Uh, they didn't know what to do with him. He kind of got lost in the system and ended up here. And uh, he was actually one of my first horses that, uh, I, I, that got to see a kid in a wheelchair. And I wasn't sure how he was going to react. And uh, I say that horse right there and a four-year-old uh, changed my life. I want to say something else about the horses that everybody needs to know, the people out there in the television land. <clears throat> horses know who is riding them. Yeah. They, you know, they talk about how the dumb horse. He's, yeah. he's not dumb. He's equipped by God to be the animal that God wanted him to be. And they understand who is on their back. Yeah. Is that not true? That is very true. You know, and, and we, we've, we've seen it happen right here where, the, where, where one of the riders would have a seizure yeah. on the horse. The horse stops. Yeah. Well, why? Being responsive to the He knows mm -hmm. what's yep. going on. And then when the, when, the, when the person gets through the seizure, the horse starts off again. Yeah. They know who's on their back. Absolutely. And uh, that's what's exciting about, and, about this to, to me. And this ranch has made those horses accessible to these riders that that's never right, thought this is a possibility. Right, Ryan. Amen. Yeah. Jack, yeah. how can folks get involved out here? Well, you got to call first. Yeah, <coughs> absolutely. You have to call. <laughs> yeah. We want people to come that, yeah. that uh, uh, are just interested and people who want to support us. Absolutely. Too. Well, good. I can't thank you guys enough. Jack, thanks for joining yeah. me. And Guy, Ryan, you guys thank are you. doing, thank doing you amazing, amazing things here. And I just was so appreciative to host me out here this morning to get to learn a little more thank about you. it. So, Our pleasure. Thank yeah. you, guys. I'm here with Stephanie Orozco, one of the riders here at Heart of the Horse. Stephanie, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. Well, let me begin with, how did you get involved here at Heart of the Horse? I'm actually um, a student at Fresno State, and I'm in a marketing class where we had to do a project for a nonprofit, and I found Heart of the Horse. So we, I came here and we started a, a blog, and we wrote stories about all of the riders that come out here. And Guy and Carrie were like, "We got to get you on a horse." So I, I was scared at first, but I did it, and I fell in love. Now you never been around a horse prior never, to this. Never, never. Oh wow! Yeah. So this was your first experience. It was. And uh, tell me, like, wh what has it done for you? What is th what has this opportunity be given to you, allowed you to experience? Well, um, I was in a car accident, and so I lost all of my, like, feeling and function from the waist down. So being on a horse, it really challenges me to use my, like, lower core muscles. And <laughs> Yes, Bandit. <laughs> He's helping me out. <laughs> and um, the leg muscles that I have trouble using on my own, so... When I'm done, actually, I can just feel everything so sore, yeah. which is kind of cool because I don't feel like I actually did anything Yeah. because it's fun. And you come out here once a week, once every couple of weeks? Yeah, I do once a week. Um, it kind of switches around depending on my school yeah. schedule, but typically once a week. And uh, you've really got the bond. I mean, here's Bandit. I know. And you seem to know Bandit very well, I just do. as any, any friend would know you. Uh, but as, as you go on and you look towards the future, is this something that you're going to continue to do because it has been that good of an experience? It's been a great experience, and it's an amazing organization, and I will absolutely keep coming. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much. We've gotten to hear so many awesome stories about folks that have just never had this connection and been able to come out here and really He's experience something guy. that <laughs> that it's just something that it's really not being able to be done anywhere mm -hmm. else. So thank you so much for thank telling you. your story.
I hope you've enjoyed your time on the trail with us. Join me next time for more Valley's Gold. Production funding for Valley's Gold is provided by... Everyone enjoys getting together to laugh, to talk, and mostly to eat. It sounds so simple, but the reality is that it takes a lot of hard work to feed us. The next time you sit down to eat, remember to thank our farmers, Gar Tutelian Incorporated since 1949 at 800-696-6108. The Myers Water Bank and Wildlife Project a water resource and education program, providing an educational experience that teaches students in the Central Valley about water and wildlife. For more than 60 years, Brandt has been a major supplier of agricultural specialty products. Formerly Monterey Ag Resources, Brandt provides sustainable solutions for both conventional and organic growers. Brandt, we're proud to call the Valley home.